Awesome. So back to our bodies. Um, let's take a couple collective breaths. Just first, just a little bitty one, drawing it from the earth and maybe just pulling it up to our bellies. Here we go. Inhale a little bit. And give it back to the earth. Let's pull up. Let's dig a little bit deeper in the topsoil and pull it up maybe to our chin. Here we go. Inhale, big breath. Hold it and release, make it rain. One more again, each deep breath just gives us so much more possibility. Let's get deep into the topsoil and take it up above our heads. Here we go, inhale. And let it go. Congrats on taking breaths for yourself. And without further ado, I'll pass the mic to Nick to uh, introduce our special guests and uh, kick off our conversation. All right, guys. Hey, so I want to introduce Everett Thompson. Everett Thompson is a minister. Um, not only is he is a minister, but um, he his job, he has so many titles. <laughs> I can't begin to list all the titles that this young this man has 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 embarked on and who is working on i'll let him tell some of those things it's a, a whole lot so everyone why don't you go ahead and tell us uh some of the the multifaceted things that you have done along with ministry work yeah so peace y'all i think the um hmm, i think the most important thing to me is i'm a southerner by birth and by choice um from North Carolina, from rural North Carolina, um, born and raised, uh, and I live and reside here in Lithonia, Georgia. Um, I am a father of a beautiful um, little person um, who's seven and is uh, my, uh, I would say my, my, my best partner, a coaching partner in how do I facilitate or move into life. Um, and I have the joy and the privilege to support folks in movement, uh, particularly social justice movement, um, in different places and areas um, to get us close to being free, um, however that looks um, every day um, in practice, but um, in service and liberation. So um, I am the great, uh, so my day job is I am uh, with a group called Grits and Greens LLC. Uh, we do organizational development. Um, I say I'm a purveyor of joy. Um, architect of infrastructure and uh, movement building and trainer. Um, and I support another group called Bold, Black Organizing for Leadership and Dignity as a trainer. So those are my main two. Um, yeah, we 10 years. So those are my main two places of service outside of ministry, where I'm a uh, minister for, with, the, with the United Church of Christ, uh, Kirkwood United Church of Christ here in Decatur, Georgia. So yeah, that's me. <laughs> Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started right with the first question. Uh, the first question that we have for you, Everett, is what comes up for you when you read the title of the discussion, which is Tears This Season, Reimagining Family and Celebrations and What Happens to Your Body? Um, what thoughts and associations do you have with that? Yeah, the first one was a big, like, sigh, right? <laughs> like, like... Ah, um, I mean, there's definitely love and joy, right, around being, you know, thinking about this is the holiday season, this is time where family can come together, my varied of families, um, chosen, and also, um, well, they're all chosen in different ways, um, but uh, family in those, in those different circles, but also just um, in my body, I, I feel some heat, I feel like a lot of some anxiousness around, you um, you know, we're all in transition in different ways um, and thinking about, you know, even some nostalgia. Um, like I have a lot of nostalgia around what holidays used to be, could be. Um, and then there's also the reality of what they really were. Mm -hmm. And so being able to tease those things out for myself and, um, and be in active communication with myself around that. Um, and then thinking forward around, because I do have a little person, um, mm -hmm. what what well, what type of traditions or um, what is the texture 
of holidays that I want. Um, um, Elijah, Elijah goes by they, them pronouns. Um, what do they want um, within their holiday traditions? And so um, there's a lot of like, yes, excitement. Then a lot of like, mm. um, and then there's a lot of like, eh. so yeah, it's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. <laughs> yeah. Full plate, basically. Full plate. <laughs> Full plate. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. I want to ask a follow-up question about that, just in terms of, um, do you ever find yourself, um, uh, the term is transference, but I want to use a more accessible term. Um, I'm thinking of like, basically like, any longing or pain that you might feel about what you said, like what they used the holidays used to be or what you were hoping they would be. Do you, does that ever translate to like how you show up to your child in terms of like pressure or like anything? Yeah. Yeah. That's a, yes. Um, absolutely. Uh, the transference for me looks like, um, the nostalgia, the picture I have um, of myself and of my family in Green Level, North Carolina, um, where folks worked in the mill, um, my grandmother, my great grandmother there, and other folks in the family. Um, that was the family house people came to. So there was food, there was conversation, um, but there was uh, there was abundance. There was also some scarcity, right? So there wasn't a lot of toys or a lot of like, yeah, you're not going to ask for so much because you knew that um, the the means were thin, um, but the love was great, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and thinking about that in relationship to Elijah. Um, where there is more abundance, right? There's definitely love and there's joy, and they have no problem asking for the world, right? <laughs> you know, like, they're like, I deserve it, absolutely. And I'm like, yeah, absolutely right. But also um, how to right size um, my own, um, like my own longing of like what I wanted then, but also, you know, where I come from with um, what will be their experience in this time, in this place for them, right? So, um, yes, you should definitely ask me for some things. And yes, you might get some of them. So, you know, not going overboard to overcompensate. Um, um, uh, but yeah. also like, yeah, so not buying you everything and then adding more stuff because I didn't have that or I couldn't have that. Yes. Um, which is my yeah. own piece, right? Um, but also not giving you nothing because it's like, well... I didn't have it. You don't deserve it either, right? So how do you right size it? <laughs> yeah. Um, oh goodness. But uh, so so yeah. So there is that, and just being intentional about that. Um, those conversations that are happening in my head, um, and um, and laying it out there to say, oh, okay, and to check it with, okay, what? <laughs> this is a different time. Conditions have changed. Uh, this is a different person. Um, that is not me in little form. That is actually a little person in little form. Wow. Uh, and we can totally. do something different, right? Um, and so, um, so yeah, so, you know, but we do, so one thing that I really try to do, um, and I'm not always successful at it, is that um, we, they get one, get one gift that they really want. We give a gift um, to someone, to a shelter, someone, someplace uh, that they get to pick. Um, and then we make a gift um, so mm. that we are also making something for each other um, so we can see the levels of like our impact um, in that way. Um, so, yeah. Mm. 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 That's really beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Follow healing. We're trying to heal. <laughs> that part. That part. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. What about y'all, though? I mean... Y'all do holidays too. How does that come up for y'all and y'all bodies? Lots of food for me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Lots of food. I come from a family. Um, I come from a family where we show our love through cooking mm-hmm. and we show our love just being there and opening our house up to whomever don't have a home or whoever don't have a family or to be with. So those, those still resonate with me. And I still do that now to this very day. Like I just got rid of a whole bunch of food. Even though it was just me, myself, here by myself, I literally cooked a whole Thanksgiving meal 
and just froze what I could not eat and try to give away everything else because cooking is something that resonates with my family. And that's how I, I feel close to them, even though they're all the way in St. Louis and I'm in Atlanta. Um, it allows me to feel close to them. And a lot of times we'll cook on the phone. So I'm talking to my mom like, all right, girl, I'm cooking these greens, girl. What, what, what else do I need to add to this? Or I'm making this mac and cheese. This is I'm doing it the way that we used to do it. So, I mean, that's the way that I kind of be able to get my family and us to be able to be involved, even though we're far away. And then having that same tradition will open my home up to whomever don't have a place to go to for the holiday. Mm, beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you so much. And I have been the recipient of those gifts of that food. <laughs> and I hope to continue to be. Please and thank you. Woo. Yeah, you you really make noise with the pots and pans. Baby, you know, that's that's how I show my love. Let's do my yes. Picture. Yes, indeed. Um, it is ever changing for me. Uh I have mostly positive memories of the holidays. Um, as a child, um, I feel spared by my family not taking it too serious. Um, like it, they, it wasn't hyper Christianized or like, it wasn't like making me, um, you know, believe in a particular narrative about the birth of Jesus in a way that felt harmful because church didn't feel good at, as a child. So that they didn't up the church during Christmas. It was just mostly, you know, every now and then throughout the year. Um, and they weren't like, we got to get in the holiday spirit. We got to get decorated. We got, they were mostly like a little bit black radical with it. Like no white guy gave you this. We worked all year for these things. Truth be told, you know, and they were like Jackson five, Santa Claus is a black man, you know, Christmas soul, uh, music, singing with the family to like the temptations, those type of memories um, and shame uh, because we equally celebrated Kwanzaa. And in the eighties, I just, it just seemed cheesy to me. I had shame around, and now I appreciate it. It was a great seed planting, but as a kid, everyone around me was celebrating Christmas and Hanukkah. And here I am talking about, uh, you know, the Kanara and all this. And so it just felt like an other rain almost. Um, so there was some shame around the holidays. Um, and then, you know, that felt like a lifetime ago, I guess where I am now, fast forward, I am in the process of trying to create new traditions, like even name what are our traditions? Do we even have tradition? Uh, I don't know if we did. Um, and there was a little bit, I guess, but um, as my relationship with my family of origin evolves, um, there's been conflict in the past. As it evolves, um, I have to choose between connecting in that way and being subjected to maybe pronouns or other things that feel not right or harmful, or breaking the connection for that holiday for the season not seeing them but then spending time with other folks where I can get honored and respected so it feels like a hard contradiction um and I'm both not about to throw them away and not about to not be respected so <laughs> so I'm figuring it out that's my answer yeah I get that. Let me ask you all a question. Um, just talking about it, we talked about it, what it looks like as adults, um, Christmas and or what the holidays look like as adults. But how how has how have you all looked at the holidays as children? Like when when you're a child, how how do you look at the holidays as as children, as as a kid? Because I know for me, as a kid, I was just it was something about the Christmas music. It was something about the smells of the food. And it was something about seeing that one uncle who I know was gonna be real drunk and get out of pocket. <laughs> and it was the family argument, the conversations that sometimes have after that as a kid that I actually still remember to this very day. 
so do you all have any experiences as as kids or as um as children to re remember and reminisce on the holidays great question i'll ask our special guest <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I um, <laughs> I'm I'm smiling because like, uh, and my heart is like my chest is really full because it's like all of the things that who I am is because of my great grandma, my grandma, mm -hmm. and my family and community in Green Level, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. um, and the White House that sat that's at the corner of East Simpson and West Simpson on Highway 49. All of that, uh, all of that is what has made me, um, yeah, who, what forms me. And so um, what we used to do, so my great grandma um, was the matriarch of the community. And so, and she baked cakes and she sew, mm -hmm. and she could sew. And so she would bake cakes all the time like that's what, i love cakes i love sweets uh, but cakes is my favorite right cakes and cupcakes because cupcakes you don't have to share but i digress so <laughs> cakes were the thing right so mama would make cakes and folks would call in their cake orders and say you know her name was john c grandma johnny you gonna make such and such ain't john c you gonna make such and such so caramel cake coconut cake um chocolate cake um pound cake um I love chocolate pie, you know, everything handmade. Um, and she used to make these yeast rolls. She only made yeast rolls on Thanksgiving, Christmas, and sometimes New Year's, maybe, okay. um, with a giblet gravy, right? That like the, but the rolls would take all day. Anywho, dinner wow. was always at three o'clock, and all my cousins and aunties and uncles, they would all come because the food was done. Everybody, like Christmas Day, everybody had finished, they had dressed up, you know, they're at the house, there's music playing. Um, my brother, um, who, my brother played the piano, and so we had a piano in our home, and everyone could sing, alleged. Mm. And so you would have <laughs> all the singing, all the food, um, and my, my um, you know, yeah, my uncles, uh, they would go outside after a while, sit on the front porch. And you could smell the smell of tobacco because they smoke pipes. Mm -hmm. And there was always conversation and just like, yeah, just laughter. And so, um, and as a child, like, you know, so we, and again, we wake up early in the morning too to get to the Christmas tree. Uh, my brother, big gay homosexual in this small little rural town. And also my cousins had so many drag queens and stuff in my, in my family. Nice. The house would be, would be decked to the nights, okay? <laughs> Every year, that was a certain, a different, we would have the biggest tree. And because like, you know, it's a family, my brother would actually do most of the people's trees in the community. And so, and, and like, and it was a production because he was glamorous. And so there would be the tree, the garlands, the outdoors, everything, right? Oh, wow. And so, um, and yeah, and it would just be, you know, so you'll wake up early in the morning, you would smell the freshness um, mm -hmm. there will be some fools and breakfast and you need to get out, play, whatever you want to do, be back to get dressed, um, because of the family was coming and it would last all night long. I mean, we had to go to bed cause they're like, this is grown folk business. Y'all need to go on, go on and be with yourself. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, and that was always the Christmas story. So mm -hmm. well, we didn't go to church on, on Christmas Eve because well, for also everybody was at the house anyway. So, mm -hmm. you know, where, where we were, Jesus was too. So, uh, so <laughs> and Jesus is everywhere, baby. Yeah, yeah, them yeah. Them. <laughs> Jesus is definitely in them cakes. Yeah, basically, that would be a prayer meeting one way or another. And then the rest <laughs> of it would be, uh, you know, it would just be just, just talking. Um, and the talking would be about, like, you know, from the past, you know, there was always the who's not here, who's been here. Uh, and also, mm -hmm. like, you know, like what's happening in the future? Um, and once I got older, folks were able to, we were able to go out on that night, you know, maybe to the, you know, we'll, we'll sneak away to someplace. <laughs> but yeah, I, uh, I still have like fond memories of, uh, of, of growing up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But them cakes. Ooh. Oh man, that sounds, I'm so hungry now. Thank you for that. Ooh, I want some Jimmy Grace and East Rose. Okay. I mean, I I've never had that. Cobbler. Peach cobbler with some so ice cream. Oh, yeah. See, I don't like cooked fruit. Me either. I don't eat cooked fruit. Yeah. I don't eat cooked fruit. Yep. But Nick, I so appreciate the question because I feel like I started to think back how it was. 
but this has really given us the opportunity to just sink into some sweet memories, which feels like a nice salve, you know, for these times. Um, so I'll just name maybe two or three that came up. Um, we, I, I was like, did we have tradition? We did. One is that, mo okay, so mostly I'd go to uh, Jackson, Mississippi or Ruval or the Delta uh, to be with my mom's side of the family. I also am from St. Louis, as Nick mentioned. And like a lot of folks from St. Louis, we up South. So my parents root in Mississippi and we would go back there for the holidays and it felt like going to another world. And I loved it. It felt like even though Jackson is a city and my cousins are the same age as my brother and I, their experience uh, around race and class and other things was like a whole nother world than my experience in St. Louis. So that was great, just talking to them. Um, and uh, the one of the tradition that our, our parents had started, I guess they had been hounding their parents to open gifts like days before Christmas. And so finally my grandparents lost patience and said, okay, y'all can go ahead and start it, open them on Christmas Eve. So to this day, there is a tradition. We open gifts on Christmas Eve, not Christmas day. Um, the other thing is I grew up celebrating winter solstice and other indigenous holidays. So I still celebrate the 21st winter solstice. And then third is um, driving to see Christmas lights. Some in a neighborhood somewhere. Now me and Nick are about to pay to do with some professional, you know, go to <laughs> Atlanta Botanical Gardens. But in back in the day, there would just be neighborhoods that were known to be decked out. And, you know, y'all let y'all light bills be high. We'll come enjoy it in our car. <laughs> so um, I still love that. And, you know, I, what I'm referencing is that, uh, you know, Nick and I have a, uh, a familial relationship out, outside of our work dynamic. And I was like, let's go look at lights, boo. So yes to that tradition. Thank you for the question. Uh, no problem. No problem. I think... For me, some of the things that I remember was putting up Christmas lights. Let me let y'all know, I'm not a handy, I'm not your girl who's about to go outside and put up Christmas lights. I'm not her, she's not me, together we're not me. That's not something I have ever been the one to do. So I will always huff and puff because I do not like putting up lights. I like the aftermath and looking at them. So I will always disappear when it came time to putting up lights. Mm -hmm. um and I remember there was a tradition that tradition stopped a long time I think probably at that probably turned about seven or eight but we used to always go out and pick the Christmas tree and like chop it down and um and then bring it up and then you know put it up I think when my father started getting older he was like we're not doing that <laughs> And then we will always go to like the store to, to buy the, 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 the real Christmas trees. And then it got to a point where my mom was like, I'm getting tired of these pine needles, cleaning up these pine needles. So now it's the artificial Christmas tree with the lights. So those kind of traditions, I, it's just weird because I remember kid, we had kid traditions. And now as an adult, I have adult traditions that I used to do with my parents like the spike eggnog we do now together while we're putting up the Christmas tree and the spike eggnog while we're cooking the day before. So I remember things like that. I remember when we had the elders in our family, when I was old enough to drive, um, I would have to get in the car, go pick up my grandmother, cause she's scared to drive at this point, pick up my, um, my other great aunt. She ain't driving nothing. She had a car, but she just, they just stopped driving, but they always kept their cars, which is really weird to me. So I went to go pick them up. So picking them up, I would pick them up. I can't drive too fast and I can't drive too slow. My grandma used to have this thing where she would raise her hand up to the side to, to hold on to it if you move too fast. So I used to play with her with that. Meanwhile, my aunt, uh, my great aunt in the back is cussing out my grandma because <laughs> she's doing too much. So those are the kind of traditions that I miss and that I remember of the elders of my family and remember the gifts. Uh, you weren't opening your gift before, before Christmas Eve. That's just, you're not doing it. You had to wait till Christmas day. Um, and then of course the gifts turned into money. So they would give you money 
now instead of doing gifts. So they would give us money on Christmas day. And then on the 26th, we would go shopping Mm -hmm. and we would buy stuff for ourselves. And then a lot of times I would use my Christmas money to buy gifts for my parents. So those are the kind of things that I remember. And um, the church thing wasn't really big for us on Christmas. It was just being together and being with family. But a question that I do have for forever with some of the titles and some of the things that you have, you know, you've done with work, um, with working and earning your master of divinity uh, from Emory University and also becoming an ordained minister. Give me one moment. My uh, screen just went blank. <laughs> uh, my e. Okay. Um, and also being an ordained minister. Um, have these influenced your views and values and traditions and family dynamics during the holidays? Yeah, and I'm I'm in process of being ordained. Um, and oh, okay. And my, okay. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, my focus is uh, is actually chaplaincy, um, and the reason why chaplaincy um, just in a I think in a in a more accessible way is being with people um, as they're moving through life, right? Um, and and what's been really what I what I feel being called to do, particularly being with Black trans and gender non-conforming folks, um, wherever we are um, in our journey, um, being called in to actually hold space, um, be able being able to kind of work with folks. Um, through whatever theological leaning they may have, uh, but really being present. And, you know, with, uh, with my title as a minister at, you know, um, at Kirkwood United Church of Christ, one of my roles is actually talking to, and, and this is a very, um, you know, very white affluent um, church, um, a congregation. We do have some young people, um, but what I get to do is actually check in on folks. Um, talk to some of the elders who might not have um, folks who are going to check in with them, or they might be estranged from their families. Um, so I get to talk with them and be with them. And particularly during the holiday, um, I try to um, up how many times I can I like talk with folks, or at least make phone calls um, because it is still COVID. I don't do a lot of face to face unless um, you know one because I want to keep myself safe and them safe as well. Um, and so um, I'm limited in that. Uh, and then, um, and also having space after services um, so folks can have a place to land, right? And so um, really checking in on folks in that way. Uh, and my other hat of, uh, I call it movement chaplaincy, uh, movement support, is also working with Black, uh, particularly Black movement folks, where like this is also a time where sometimes our campaigns are coming to a close um, and there's grief, um, that's heartache. There is the nostalgia of who we used to be, um, who we are becoming, like that that pause, the same way that there is this darkness and the, you know everything is getting darker sooner. Um, so being able to be with folks and just talk with them uh, wherever they are uh, or just remind them that you're not alone um, and that that there are times that we can definitely connect. And so um, during the holiday season, particularly during the month of December, um, I see myself doing more of that. Um, and, and not just December, I think that like, I try to look at like, what are the lulls? Um, lulls in different people campaigns, lulls in like what's going on in people's lives, and particularly the holiday, um, making sure prior to the holiday that folks are making a plan. Like, what is your self-care plan, right? What is it that you really think? Like, you know, like there is, a, I always can say, I'm like, there's nostalgia and then that's the reality. And where are you, right? <laughs> and what exactly do you need without shame, without guilt, um, you know, without the fear of m- missing out, all those things of like, what is it that you're gonna need so you can be resourced and resource yourself to move through? Um, and I, And so, um, that has been my kind of my temperature check and the work that I'll be doing, um, not the work, um, the, the joy I'll be creating in the midst of uh, this month and pretty much up until like the second week of January, um, because at the same time, a new year, you know, there's a pressure to be all new. 
Uh, and then there's the reality is like, you know, every day is an opportunity to be new, right? <laughs> so how do we de-armor some of this stuff or de um, de-emphasize the change and just kind of flow with it? So yeah. I appreciate that. Um, I actually suffer from sad sometimes. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate that. For those who don't know what sad is, that seasonal um uh, uh, affective disorder. And it's just basically navigating between the seasons and I don't do well with navigating to the seasons. Sometimes I get to a real low place, um, especially sometimes during the holidays since my family is not here. Um, sometimes I see myself falling into that, especially when the seasons get closer. And I don't, sometimes I don't catch it. I don't normally catch it until it really hits. I'm like, why do I feel this way? Why? And I think about it and I'm like, oh, it's the holidays. It's darker. Um, it's not a lot of like um, work is getting more heavier for me during the holidays, typically. So I'm dealing with with that piece of it. So I, I recognize. So I appreciate you speaking about it because I, I think that sad can sometimes go really undetected. And people don't think about that part of uh, mental health, especially during the, during the season and the holidays. Yeah, yeah. It's also it's a thing when you say work is getting really hectic. Um, if you're also in a work environment where you actually have a break, sometimes our work is the only place we have connection. And when you have the break and there's a break in connection, like what is the what is your plan? And so I like as I think about, oh right, this is you know even virtually, this is the place that I know I have something I can do. I'm I'm jumping in something to be able to create your plan early on. Like we're Tomorrow's December 1. I really encourage, I'm doing it myself. What is my holiday plan for myself, right? <laughs> like, you know, like how do I not overcommit? Um, and um, and also how do I just keep a balance? You know, what is the one thing? Because I also don't want to overcommit, right? But what is the one thing I know I need to do every day? Um, just to make sure that like I'm checking in with myself. Um, and it for me, it is every day I need to do. Um, I try to do prayer outside. Um, I do my prayer and meditation outside every day. So it, anytime during the day, it's just got to be done during the day. So sometimes it'll be 11 o'clock at night, but I got to do my one, <laughs> like I got to do this outside um, and just making sure that I'm, I'm, you know, that is the one thing I can keep myself um, and keep the commitment to myself as well. So, so create your plans. <laughs> so like, Nick, create your plan, yummies. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, that plan is being it's being navigated as we speak. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it's being navigated. Holiday, do you have any um I guess uh I guess plans of of how you handle the holidays? Yeah. Um yeah, it's been delicate uh maybe just the past couple years. Um when I had like a second coming out. Like 11 years ago, I came out as trans and my family's like, cool, cool, we love you. But then they made, they didn't really shift with me, no attempt to shift pronouns and other things. So maybe five years ago, I was like, hey, y'all, remember this thing? Can you at least try? And then some folks have a hard time with that. So, you know, as I referenced earlier, it's, it's touch and go where I spend my time. <clears throat> but um, it's not, you know, a complete separation. So I, I start thinking about what it might look like probably around late. Well, August, mid-August starts my season of grief anyway. And then the holidays and like y'all saying, the less sunlight and the more cold, which is legit. And even if you don't have diagnosed sad, most humans are impacted by less access to the most powerful resource, which is the sun. You know, it does have all sorts of impact on our every system, endocrine, nervous ashy skin, immune system working harder, all the things. Um, so I think that th there, and there's a paradox in the capitalist world where we speed things up come fall. It's Labor Day. It's end of grant season. It's get everything out before the, before the calendar year, which, you know, it's a calendar year that was created by Romans. Like it's not, it's arbitrary. It could be other people operate on 13 months, you know, so, but then we, we, you know, we create time around capitalism essentially. And, um, 
and it's the exact opposite of what our body wants. And so having that knowledge, I do try to bend with the seasons and slow down as soon as fall starts to kick in, start thinking about how it's going to be in those darker days, colder days. Um, yeah. I want to uh, also just ask a follow-up question of Everett, just so I got clarity. I want to make sure I heard what you said. Um, you said after you hold, after like maybe like a service or something, you will then stay after and hold space for people. And would that be a service where you will have um, preached or ministered, like written, pre prepared something? I'm just tracking the amount of work. Like you prepare something, you facilitate it, and then you hold space for people. Did I get that right? No, I don't okay. preach every Sunday. Um, so uh, we have a, a pretty nice roster of other ministers. And so I preach once a quarter, sometimes twice a quarter. Okay. Um, but I do provide, like I will do something in service. So reading the passages, prayer, um, some some type of function. Uh, but after, or Zoom minister, because we are hybrid, yes. Um, but then after service, um, there is a request. And what I try to do is, we will, I will hold space. So that might be, you know, folks, uh, if I notice there's a parishioner that hasn't been in a while, hey, how you doing? Like I have a list of people that I'm like, oh, okay, I want to check in with such and such, um, to check in and see how they're doing, how's, you know, did surgery go okay? Um, and then we also have every Wednesday um, as, a, as a community of faith, um, folks get on the call and uh, we have a, a call. That's normally the same five, six people, which is fine. Um, and other folks might come and go. Uh, but we, we see the ebbs and flows as well, um, was, was as well there. Um, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I I just wanted to really make sure I understood that and also uplift it, A, because I think there is a lot more work and intentionality put into pastoral care than us in mental health uh, or even the like woo medicine, yoga, meditation, either track than we un understand or know. And B, um, it's just a different model of receiving care that I didn't even, as a user, I don't think I even know how to access that. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. It's interesting. I, I, yeah, I wish my preacher would sit with me after, or anybody in the church. I don't know if in the Black Baptist and now Black Gay Baptist model I go to, if that's really actually happening or if I know how to access that. So that's curious. Thank you for that. Yeah, I know some, I know like unity, some folks will do that, right? Um, I think that, you know, what I'm what I'm curious about, particularly with ministry, um, because there are, there's a lot of folks who use the title as minister. Um, what part of your ministry is also pastoral? What is, what is care? Hmm. Um, and what does care really look like? Look like? Um, like my orientation of care is not telling. Um, it is actually really sitting um, and asking, asking the question, you know, what would be helpful for you, right? And before we end um, our time, um, and sometimes it could be just a, a simple conversation, uh, but I'm tracking it as like, this was a touch, right? I'm also an organizer, right? So I'm also like, okay, they've had X amount of touches. Um, okay, this is, what we're, this is what we're doing. This is how they're engaging or not engaging into the quality of our ministry, right? Um, and then, you know, the other thing I will always ask, would you like me to pray? Or would you like to pray? Or would you like to just sit in silence? Would you like to meditate? Would you like to breathe? So to have like a list of different things, it's like, hey, well, how do we want to close this time? Right. <laughs> I will say, how do we want to close this time? And sometimes I'm like, yeah, I've been here too long. We got to close this. Um, but like being very intentional about that. Um, and so, yeah, I too am curious around how are other folk within ministry um, um, offering that um, or not? Um, um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Everett. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I appreciate that. I have a, uh, another question. Um, Everett, how do you deal with triggering comments during the season with family if they're said? Oh. Yeah, I, I know. <laughs> we trigger by the question, but it's a good. Uh, <laughs> Talk about if they say, you know, when they say it. Um, I think that it's it's interesting because um, I always think back um, 
you know, my grandma, grandma Jonasy, mama, uh, and my grandma Eunice, they were because they were the matriarchs of the family, folks just didn't say anything, right? Like you can have all the thoughts you want, but them grandma, them, them, them grandma, them, 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 them children right there. You don't play with them children. Um, and so, so that's one piece. I think now, and if there was something, there will always be like that, that look of, I know you didn't. Uh, so there was some protectiveness around that. I think now as I am, you know, more into like, I'm, I'm older now, you know, um, being able to address it. Say so like, you know, you like, you know, speak up. So we want to say that again, you know, is there a question? If it's disrespectful, I will say, you know, that's just disrespectful. Um, that's not how we treat each other. Um, and I will leave. I have no problem whatsoever leaving to protect my peace, right? Okay, and we'll state it like, you know, because of this, you know, you have said this, therefore, you know, it's disrespectful. I feel disrespected and I'm leaving or I will ask someone else to leave. Um, like, <laughs> you know, in the same way, and I, I think that's the through line, even with Elijah, like, you know, there's a way of like, you know, how do we model that? Like, you will teach people how to treat you. Um, so we want to, I want to model that for them, right? Like, no, if you feel disrespected, let's call the question, you know, like, you know, <laughs> is there an issue? Like, you know, let's address it. And then, you know, if you don't feel like, if you don't want to address it, then we're gonna, what are our choices? We're gonna make some real intentional choices um, so that we can lead. So, but yeah, no, I don't, yeah. Mm -mm. Time is an unrenewable resource. You I'm can't kidding. get it back. <laughs> 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 I, just, I remember so many times sitting at the dinner table during the holidays and you know, everybody's munching and crunching, crunching and munching on food. And then everybody look at me and say, so, who are you dating these days? And I'm like, <laughs> mm -hmm. myself. <laughs> I'm dating myself. Well, there, there isn't a special guy or a special girl that you, you're interested in. I'm just this like. This is before you were out. This is before I was out. And I would just be like, myself. <laughs> there's, there's nobody else. So then I started having females coming over like my friends, my my good Judy, my good female friend. So my friend would come up and say, oh, so this is your girlfriend, this who you dating? And I'm just like, no, she's just my friend. Well, they always just your friend. And then I'm just like, oh, but you know, they're, all, they're elders. So mm -hmm. I, I never felt comfortable to set boundaries with my elders. I just kind of grinned and took it. Mm -hmm. But inside of myself, I would be cringing. Mm -hmm. Listening to it and cringing, going through it, but I just be like, "It's one Christmas, just Christmas. It'll be over with. They'll be gone in a couple of hours." And I just, I used to just bite and and, and go through it. Um, and now I kind of wish those days were still here because now my elders are no no longer here. So now I have my mom and my dad, and I, I love them. But my mom and my dad, I I have, we've already. There's been never any issues when it comes to the holidays with them. It was always my elders that was triggering to me, but I didn't know how to set those boundaries with them because I was taught that you respect your elders. Hmm. Um, you don't really correct them. You just let them go. You just let them do it. And I hmm. always had a hard time with that. And I would just kind of be like, okay, I'm just going to go downstairs in the basement. Mm. I would gather my food, go in the basement and watch whatever TV was, whatever was going to be on TV mm -hmm. and not necessarily engage with them while, while we were eating. Mm -hmm. Because I ain't got time for those kind of questions. I'd be like, this, this is too much. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, um, yeah, that, that brings me sadness. And, you know, for little Nick, um, <laughs> if you sat at those, at those table and, and, um, and also like the you know, the pull of what does it mean to still want to have connection with uh, family, with our people, even when um, they can call, when they cause harm, right? Um, and also knowing that, like, and this is a part of, uh, of us, right? Um, uh -huh. Those contradictions. Um, and it also made me think about, you know, um, like, because I am probably the third or second generation, uh, or like, you know, 
like of folks in my family that came out um, as queer been through. Like, I wonder what my brother uh, experienced as being, you know, openly queer, um, not really open, not, he wasn't openly queer. Um, he was gay and they would always ask, you know, your girlfriends and stuff like that. But I think they paved the way, right? Um, and, you know, they paved the way, they made the sacrifice. So my, I think for me, um, my um, arrogance, <laughs> you're like, sometimes it was just arrogance. Like, I wish you would say something, mama, right? <laughs> like my arrogance of being able to live in my full truth um, truly came um, because someone else was able to create that. And so I don't know who you created that space for, um, for you and your family, but I'm sure you did. Um, and it does come at a cost. And I just want to say thank you. Yes. I, I appreciate it. I never thought about it, but I, I really do appreciate it. But yeah, I think I paid away for a lot of my family members <laughs> who are out now. <laughs> they weren't out then, but they're most definitely out now. And it's all group of us. When I was told, when I came out that I was the only one and outside of family don't do that. Um must be on, on somebody on my mom's side of the family that's gay because ain't nobody on my side of the family. So that's not something we do. And then here we go. <laughs> mm -hmm. Years later, everybody's just out the woodwork. Hey, and I'm just like, oh, okay. So I really do sometimes feel like that um, that gay grandfather of, <laughs> of coming out in my family sometimes. Sometimes that's, it's an interesting thing. And Nick, and not just the family. I mean, we won't go here in this conversation, but also with at H at HBCU, how like my God kids are at HBCUs in choir programs like you were, but it's safe now. And you help pay, make that safe for them. Yeah. Some 20, almost 20 years ago, you know, um, years ago. <laughs> um, Come running home. <laughs> thank you. Double down on the thank you. Um, I want to make sure that we make a little bit of time to see if anyone um, in the call has a question for any of us, but especially uh, Everett, um, and also just uplifting that beautiful thing I heard, A, in the these conversations we're having with our family now are paving the way for generations to come, and also in the um, practice, uh, uh, teaching, setting models for uh, teaching people how to love you, how to treat you. And part of that is boundary setting. And I think this really gets into, I wish we had more time of um, um, yeah, like human dignity versus some of our cultural, social mores. You know, I think we all are, have a shared particular black Southern experience of respecting our elders. We, I, I think I speak for all of us. We don't come from families and cultures that talk to our elders any kind of way. So with that, how do we also find our dignity as a, as a full autonomous human being? So, and I think that's always in question, you know, how to do both. And so thank you Everett for just uplifting um, that you respected your grandma and great grandma. They paved the person who, the man you are today. And for your child, you were set the model. You will leave if it gets harmful, you know, if it gets disrespectful, you're not just, it's not an unconditional respect. You know, we have unconditional love, but we have conditions on how we're treated, right? Like we can give unconditional love, but we're not gonna accept anything. <laughs> and so thank you for uplifting that. Um, I, we just have a few minutes left, but um, just want to check in with our, our very intimate group tonight. Um, does anyone on the call have a question for either of us or for Everett? Um, sure, I guess um, I would say just like I really appreciated hearing everybody's perspectives and uh, on talking about like the holidays and having those memories that are bound up with how you kind of approach the holiday today as well. Um, I would just say like, how do you have that, you know, how do you kind of balance having maybe some really good memories of the holidays as a kid? And then also, you know, I guess from my perspective, maybe not being as in touch with my family now, um, you know, how, how do you kind of, I guess, approach, you know, from, from, I guess, a religious standpoint, almost like a forgiveness, even if you're not necessarily able to 
be as intimate or as close at the holidays as as you would prefer like how how does that kind of mesh together yeah um you know what 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 is coming out for me is like this, this the concept of forgiveness right like um there's one piece that um, I'm constantly writing, or at least I'm thinking to myself of like, what are the letters or the notes that I want to, what are the words I want to say, or what do I want to express to family who, some who are past, um, uh, some who are still present, but we don't, um, one day, I don't think they're at a place uh, where they could actually, um, well, actually, no. I'm not at a place where I can actually receive what their response would be. And so, because I'm not at a place that I can receive whatever the response would be, I am still working through what are the things that I want to say and actually, what is it that I need, right? Um, is there a need and what can I actually provide for myself, right? And so I have gone through many different letters around like uh, writing um, and sometimes recording the thoughts. This I know to be true, right? It's like always like my therapist, like this I know to be true um, about whatever the situation is, whatever about the person is to allow me to get it out my head and out my heart for somewhere else so I can really mend. Um, and so I think for some of the folks, for me, for some of the people that I'm estranged from, um, due to time, due to other things, um, you know, I have been creating this uh, little document, this little note document. Um, the other people, um, you know, and also just getting clear about like what it is, what it is that I want um, and making sure it's not from, a place of nostalgia, right? Um, and then I'm peeling back and I, I keep going back to that because I have this fantasy, right? I love Hallmark Channel movies. And so I, I know this is my guilty pleasure. And so in my mind, sometimes I will create a memory as is, if it was the unfolding of this Hallmark movie, but that is not true, right? <laughs> right? When I really look at it, it's like, actually, no, that didn't happen that way. It will not have that type of ending. The ending was what the ending was. Um, and sometimes that is just that. And I need to honor that. And there's also some beginnings. Um, and so how do I begin? And I try not to do that stuff, like trying to initiate conversations during the holidays, because that's a lot of pressure. Um, and I, 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 I don't try to like it, like high impact times like for me is not the time that I want to get into some highly emotional things because for me it gets really muddled when I am settled when I am on it when my feet are on the ground my back is against the wall you know I got a little bit more freedom then that's when I want to enter into, into conversations um and so during this time it's more about me unearthing for myself those things that I need um and so writing recording myself using the prompt decided to be true thank you edwina my therapist um just so i have a better sense of what's happening um and also grieving um it's okay to long for something it's okay to have the longing if we're clear about what we're longing for um so being curious inside those are those are the things i would say that's helped me basically so yeah well that's my chris mahana kwanzaa gift those are some gems <laughs> that, was, that was a lot of gems. <laughs> um, we're going to close out the space for just a little uh, below over time. Um, I will complete by saying thank you, uh, Everett, so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Nick, for guiding us and um, <clears throat> taking us on this journey. Thank you, Nat, for joining us. Um, Nick, I'll pass you the mic for final words um, and Everett as well. All right. Well, thank you so much, Nat. I thank you for being a part. Um, I'm glad that we were able, that you were able to come and, and have this conversation with us. Thank you so much, Everett, for being a part. Um, thank you so much for, for, for being available and making yourself available for this. So thank you so much. And that's, all I, and that's all I have. We want to go ahead and close this thing out. Final words, Everett? Oh, just thank y'all. And um, we're worthy. You're worthy. And you, each one of you, we are lovable. And we are loved. So. Hmm. Ashe. Thank you. Thanks, y'all. Take care. And we'll send out a, a message with the recording. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.